Yeah, my best friend was a football player, soccer player, and he. Uh, when I was at school, he was we were maybe 15 years old, and he was already playing for uh, Monaco uh, as a semi-pro, and I could see how he was. He loved what he was doing. He was, um, and he was so disciplined and so determined to achieve his dream. And just by looking at looking at, at him do that, I, I just realized I've got to find something that I love. And I started asking people around me, do you like what you do? I, I asked my father, I, like, I asked my uncle. People around me, all of them had the same answer. I have to work and I used, to, I, 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 I could have done this, I would have done that, but instead I've I had to go to work, I have to make money, so I couldn't do what I wanted to do. And I realized, you know, I'm going to spend my life working. I might as well enjoy what I do. And I decided to look for what I love to do. And uh, fortunately, I had, um, I loved photography. And one photographer was uh, living next door to my, to, to, to my parents' uh, shop. He, he was a fashion and uh, advertising photographer, a very nice gentleman. And I went and I learned, I, I worked with him, I, uh, I helped him and I started learning the craft of photography. And I knew at the time I was going to be a photographer and a filmmaker. The beauty of filmmaking is through images, through sound, through uh, light, music, decor. You can you can express anything you want, and you can manipulate life, you know, the way you want to. And this manipulation, if it's in, done in a good way, can inspire people, or, or can give people, can make people feel amazing, can also have people question, understand why is this, why is that, why am I here, what am I doing, uh, be a part of uh, the people that change life, changing life through storytelling, to making movies. I was lucky enough to get, the first time I got on, on a set, I was a photographer and I never had been on a set, I was already a director. <laughs> because it was just at this time, in 1986-87, where it was very fashionable to hire photographers to direct music videos. And I directed my first music videos. Uh, I had no idea, I had never been on a set before, on a movie set before. So I did moving images of what I used to do with still, and I told the story in my, in my own way. And it worked out. And it's interesting because uh, I was not looking for success at all. I was, uh, I mean, I, I, of course, you work to do your best and you work to do the, to express you yourself at the best level possible. But uh, when I started, it was not, uh, it was never uh, running after success, you know, like Madonna <laughs> or something. But uh, it came to me in a, a very surprising way. And, uh, and um, when you're not ready for success, it's very, it can be a gift and it can be as well a trap, you know? Because uh, funny enough, at school people teach you that it's going to be hard you're going to have problems, you might be unemployed. 
but nobody is teaching you how to be happy. Nobody is teaching you what are you going to do when success comes to you. <laughs> Which is very funny, but it should be something we teach to children. Because people spend the money, they blow it off, people uh, start taking drugs. So uh, very rarely I see people dealing with success in a very intelligent way being capable to manage, you know, keep their life, private life away from it, protect their children, protect their family, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and that's it. And then when you, it's also, it's also an adrenaline thing where you out on a shoot, you are with actors, you go out, you dance, you go to bars, you, you know, you, you have fun, you make tons of money, you go back home and it's the routine. And it's your, your wife with children saying, hey, you know, you need to do this and you need to make her do, do the homework, you know, do this. And there's a, such, a, such a difference between the two. Outside you're the king, inside you're just a normal man. And this is the difficult part, you know, when you find yourself alone or inside your family, in front of your mother, in front of your, your children or your family. You're just a simple, normal man. They don't even understand what it is for you outside. So therefore, your life starts shifting. You go one direction, they go another direction. And if you're not careful, you could lose the communication, you could lose the, 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 the sense of family, the sense of people you love and find yourself, you know, in a lonely place. came to me and said, Eric, thank you so much. We've sold 55 million of mascaras with your commercial. And I realized, wow, you know, by showing you a beautiful car, by showing you an amazing looking woman, a great dress, it makes you dream and it gives you this artificial dream that you don't necessarily have. Uh, society is designed to direct your dreams in the direction that they want so you can spend your money and to trap you in a way. I was really uh, one of the most uh, lucky filmmakers in, in the planet in terms of commercials. But I was unhappy inside because I was not giving 100% of the capacity that I could give because I had to serve a product every time. Isn't there anything else that you could do that would be best for humanity, for people, for the people around you? Would you want to be remembered uh, as somebody that sold 55 million mascaras? <laughs> At the time, I just went with the flow. I, it's not like I was hating my job. I love my job. Every time I would be on the set, I would be happy because I can always find something that excites me. Uh, and I was young. I did not realize that the implications. I did not realize that what I'm doing that I'm not doing something more important. So that day I decided I'm going to stop it would take me time, but I would stop doing the commercial and go back to expressing myself in any art form or shape that I could do. Um, I started making movies, short films. I made Journey 316 at the time.
God's hope is everywhere. God's light is everywhere. Listen to his voice. Listen to his words. His words are about hope. Hope. God does love you. God loves you, sir. God does love you. Open your heart to him. I had a little small drawing that I did in my in one of my piece of paper. I kept it with me for two years. It was completely almost erased. And I took it and I, I, I painted that with it. That was my first attempt to paint, to go back to painting, because when I was young, I was, I was a, a serial paint, painter. So I took the time to contribute to a portrait of that city that gave me so much pleasure, so much money, so much love. I had to go back with something, give a témoignage of something, you know. I realized that very early on, you know, I lived there for 20 years, but I realized that uh, the power of this cinema, cinematic dream, where people can't access it, can't touch anything. They think they're going to meet Brad Pitt or Marilyn Monroe at the corner of a street, but they never do. And they end up doing a shitty job in a shitty place, like uh, all of us. Many people that I meet are lonely in Los Angeles, waiting for a phone call that never comes. And sometimes, of course, they get lucky, like me and you get to touch the dream for a moment. Today I would not, I would not uh, urge a young director to go into commercials. Uh, I would say spend 10 years of your life struggling to make a movie is more worth it than spending 10 years of your life successful as a, as a director in commercials, because at the end what you want is to express yourself, you want your film to be on screen, you want, you want to see that your, what you do matters, you know. Uh, it's a sacrifice, um, but both ways it's a sacrifice. If you're successful, you're making great money, but you're doing things that don't matter, then it's a sacrifice as well. camera inside the, 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 the apartment uh, and I was living with my, my, my parents but also uh, in the apartment below were my aunts and my uncle and my grandmother so it was a very happy and tight family all together but uh, they, they had a camera one of them had a camera a photographic camera and I looked always looked at the camera every time I wanted to touch that camera Somebody would come and say, don't touch it, it's not for you. you know, you're too young, you can't touch this camera. And, uh, and so I became fascinated by the subject, by the subject, you know, that I couldn't touch. I, one time I had a look inside, it was just magic to see, to see life through that uh, uh, viewfinder. So one time uh, we were on a trip and we, we went to visit somebody from my family in Paris, in an apartment, and it's an aunt of mine, which was very, very big, heavy woman with big breasts and big features, you know. Um, and she offered me a camera. She offered me my first camera. And uh, so I was, I was really happy. I looked at this camera. I was starting to take pictures. But, um, and I was standing in the corridor of, of this apartment and I remember even today like it was, like it's, uh, it was yesterday. She stepped out of the bathroom and completely naked, completely naked. And she looked at me, she stroked a pose and she said, Eric, take a picture. 
And that was the moment where my career, my life was that that uh, got set on my destiny was uh, was was uh, was set at this time. My, my destiny was set at this time.